Hello everybody, it's Mike Levin on Thursday, September 29th, around 8.20 a.m. and I'm on my way into work and uh, I have been watching back some of my recent YouTube videos and I do see that my hand shakes more with this iPhone 6 SE than it did with the Note 5 that I was on previously, so I guess I'm going to make an effort to be my own stabilizer. Um, at least one of my viewers has suggested the GoPro stabilizer, and I have not made the move to carrying another camera device on me. I mean, here I am, some 600 videos in, and I'm still just holding my phone out in front of me, which seems to be the most practical approach because, uh, you know, this is really about um, the mood striking me to capture my thoughts. And it's not about really high production quality video. Uh, arguably, uh, even though please stay, uh, I appreciate having the audience, but arguably uh, these videos are more for me than they are for you, just so that I can uh, vocalize and think through my thoughts. As I stated in a prior video, I don't think you know what you think until you've thought it out loud. And by out loud, typing into a journal would also qualify. And an interesting thing is happening to me in my head right now as I essentially replatform myself yet again onto Jupyter Notebook. So, Jupyter Notebook it, and its uh, descendant, Jupyter Lab, which will be on the picture very soon, are. Um, platforms in and of themselves and game changers uh, because it's actually um, a much better coding environment uh, for learning and experimenting with Python than is my other favorite environment that I've uh, equally fallen in love with which is Vim and uh, those things required around it to support Vim and run Python code, so uh, Linux, and uh, I guess I'd have to throw in Git. You know, I often talk about Linux, Linux, Python, Vim, and Git as my uh, preferred platform. So I have to extend that thinking, and now I think since. Uh, Jupyter Notebook is something that can be installed on its own. You don't need all of Anaconda for Jupyter Notebook. Now, it's the easiest way to get Jupyter Notebook, and the two of them are like this out there. Some people think they're the same thing and inextricable, but I'm thinking I am going to resuscitate uh, my old Levinix project. Now, Levinix is a remarkable little piece of software because with a double click on the desktop of a Mac, uh, or a Windows machine or a Linux machine with a desktop like GNOME or KDE, you have a pop-up tiny virtual Linux environment. Um, the original archive is about 20 megabytes uh, expanded and built into a, a server that's actually a web server, a Flask web server running Python. Uh, the whole software footprint is still only 60 megabytes. Now in memory it's probably occupying uh, 256 or 512 megabytes depending on the configuration setting, but it's a portable uh, multi-platform virtual machine uh, where the files that you save are persistent. So you can keep it on Dropbox and pull up the same virtual machine from whatever desktop you sit down regardless of OS. Except, however, not on ARM platforms yet, so it couldn't be a virtual box on, say, an iPad right now. Um, but it's uh, still a um, portable code execution platform, and uh, it's gained some popularity with, like, probably around 10 downloads per day. At its peak, it was 20 downloads per day. But people like to be able to have a uh, Linux environment you can pull up and uh, install Python on and get a bare minimum, you know, uh, somewhat like an embedded system, generic Unix slash Linux uh, machine. And of course, it's tiny core Linux. I can't take credit for the uh, brilliance behind the OS version um, or the Linux 
uh, distro. So when people talk about a distro, they're really going down to, you know, the core of who invented this distro. And there's not as many as people think. There's, you know, the popular ones, Debian and Ubuntu comes from or is derived from Debian. And then there's uh, the Red Hat uh, branch and uh, Arch. Um, Tiny Core Linux is one of those. There's actually a developer who uh, is not just respinning someone else's work, but is compiling Linux from core, doing their own set of modifications for how the startup process and such begins. Well, anyway, Linux in itself is a fascinating topic, and it's what most development tools are geared towards these days, so it's worth knowing. So, uh, Linux doesn't go out of the picture, even when uh, the focus on my new platform is Jupyter Notebook. Now, Jupyter Notebook is very clearly made to be friendly to the Windows and Mac OS environments because um, it's for data scientists, and data scientists are probably normal people who haven't taken the geeky step of installing uh, Linux as their own desktop yet. They're not using GNOME or KDE or any of that. Um, they're probably using a Windows machine or a Mac. So Jupyter Notebook spans the gap between these two worlds, allowing standard tools, Linux-oriented, Unix slash Linux-oriented tools to be used on uh, the mainstream non-Linux uh, desktop platforms. So Jupyter Notebook opens the door to a lot of people who couldn't run Python in a uh, very typical standard reliable environment. Now they can. Uh, this changes the game. This means that when you do some creative work in Python to produce a deliverable, i.e. an SEO deliverable, something that gives you insight, uh, illuminates what your next step should be, everyone says, oh, it's got to be actionable. Well, you can create a deliverable that produces actionable data that's tied to different APIs like Google Analytics, Search Console, uh, maybe something through uh, local or network SQL connection uh, to your own systems, and um, or any other data source, crawlers that go out and check sites and check particular URLs, uh, knit it all together, come back, produce a deliverable, either a visualization or a set of recommendations, anything you can output with Python, even through any of the standard libraries. and. Uh, you not only have the deliverable you can deliver to your client, but you now have the process canned in a bottle. It's like a, a genie in a bottle. And you can toss over to someone else and just say, open it up and make your wish. Uh, it will run and execute reliably on your desktop if you've installed Anaconda. Uh, so still Anaconda comes into the picture. But you could also uh, bottle up, uh, I don't know, tiny little server configurations that where your Python applications are working like they're on an embedded system and you design a network application uh, right up with a virtual machine and everything. If you want to take virtual machines out of the picture and tie it to a particular operating system uh, install, you can just uh, make a Docker image and Docker can pull up and uh, run. Uh, that image can run. Uh, as if it were the native hardware, essentially. These Docker images take a level of thunking and complexity and moving parts of software management tools out of the picture. And uh, so that's uh, one of the reasons Docker is so popular. People ask me, why don't I base my work on Docker? Well, the answer is because I want to base my work on the correct abstraction layer so that the install scripts work and are always easy. So that means it's got to be a bunch of, you know, pip install things, which basically unfreezes a pip environment onto a Python environment, which already has created its operating system abstractions. So you don't, you shouldn't, it is a position of weakness to require Docker. If Docker is required in your process, you're saying I'm creating a fragile production environment that's easier just to image off and send an image of than it is to give someone an install script. Well, your stuff should not be so excessively tied to some precious state 
that an install script wouldn't work just as well. And in order for install scripts to not be operating system dependent, they should use most of their commands from the repository system built into a programming language like pip that's built into Python. And so uh, Anaconda makes it a little more complex because certain things are difficult to pip install, things that rely on the outside operating system like XML parsers. So if you're relying on that kind of stuff, you can do a Conda install because Anaconda has its own pip-like uh, software repo system called Conda. And it takes care of those things that have uh, very particular dependencies. And then uh, what you do is uh, just distribute an install script that uses most of that. And if you have to use some Linux uh, bashing script stuff, you can, uh, it makes it more fragile. But if you can uh, keep it to a bunch of pip installs and one or two conda installs, uh, you're creating a deliverable that you can just hand around the SEO community, the marketing community, or the scientific community that invented it and they could just change some little configuration settings or maybe answer some questions that are asked when you run. It configures it to your situation with your login credentials. You might have to authorize OAuth on something, but now anyone can produce that deliverable. You hand it around and uh, that is the, the brand of SEO that I am going to be uh, advocating coming up soon. That's my thing. I'm working on my brand and my image, and I do believe it's going to be Mike Levin, SEO and Daddy in New York City, program, uh, uh, Python programming SEO and Daddy in New York City, preparing our daughter for the robot uh, revolution. Anyway, I don't want to get too wacky and out there, but I definitely uh, am interested in Python because it applies to quite a particularly large set of problem domains. You see, Python lets you dabble in anything. And I'm gonna take advantage of that a lot in the upcoming videos. And uh, probably even starting with the Maker Faire starting tomorrow. Maybe that's when I'll boot my new identity. I'll need to work on some of that logo and production stuff that I've been avoiding and pretending doesn't exist. Well, anyway, that's it. Gotta get going. Thanks for joining me. Hope to see you again soon. And don't forget to subscribe.